it begins. It's a few minutes of chaos. Taking off the babies, people screaming, shouting, helping them, you know, a lot of them don't know how to swim. What does it look like to love your enemies? Warm clothes, something to eat, to drink, because some of them didn't have any water or food for like one or two days. We'll take you to a Greek island to show you Israelis helping Arab refugees on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, hello and welcome to 700 Club Interactive and welcome to our Washington, D.C. studios. We're here in support of an issue that's bringing together politicians from both sides of the political aisle, the state of Israel. And we want to show you a side of its story that you won't see in the headlines. Ever since the 1950s, Israel has been a leader in helping people around the world. Eight million people across Nepal are struggling to recover after the worst disaster Nepal has seen in nearly a century. Panic in the streets of Kathmandu. Absolutely no electricity in this area. There's no water supply. 300 million people in Africa still don't have access to clean water. The United Nations declared years ago that access to water and sanitation is a human right. Without it, human life cannot exist. Water on tap in the home is a luxury. Chaos tonight here on the island of Lesbos. There's really no end in sight to this crisis. Syrians, Iraqis, desperate refugees braving a life or death journey. So many are dying in this, this narrow sea between Turkey and Greece. A number of boats coming in this morning and this one seems to have lots of children on board. One, two, three, it begins. There is no electricity, no energy. Water exists beneath their feet. What they need is a few solar panels so that we can pump the water. Children are coming to Israel. We operate them. We host them until the operation is done and the recovery time is done. They go back home. People just come with nothing on them, you know, just the clothes, babies, old people, handicapped. At this moment, History is being written, and I want to be a part of it. Can't sit at home, see this, and not help. You see their eyes, they're hungry for education. They can lead their lives to a better future. The rescue team that we brought here are specialized in urban rescues. They told us that they hear somebody alive, a young girl missing. This is what we do in Africa, in Ethiopia, in, in India, in South America. It doesn't matter what color they are, what size they are, not only our privilege, but our, our duty. This is how changes that. The real Israel, it's what we are doing here. asking for help for everybody, like uh, Nepalese military personnel and lots of uh, foreigners also. And Israel had come straight from the airport and started digging up. And the thing they have and other didn't have is faith and hope. They found Krishna Kumari. For me, I am Syrian. For me, it's, there, is, there is no problem if I am meeting Israeli people. They are really uh, helping us and uh, helping a lot of families here and children. I'm feeling very happy. Israeli people, volunteers coming every year to teach our students. Change in uh, daily life also. No longer sick, no longer weak. I'm going to play like other children. I never interacted with uh, people from the other side, the Jewish people, but now we interact with a lot of people. You get to know people as individuals. It's a very good experience. They are really so, so special to my family. Come again, again, again! 
come again and again and again. That's what people are saying around the world as Israel reaches out with help and hope. Uh, the distinguishing factor, uh, you heard it from that Nepalese girl, that here they brought hope. What they had, what the other rescue teams didn't have was they had hope, and through that hope they were able to help people. That's a story about Israel you're not going to see in the headlines, but we want to show, you to, show it to you. And we're putting together a documentary to life. It's going to pr premiere next year in 2017 and if you want to get updates on it or share that trailer with your friends all you have to do is go to our Facebook page it's facebook.com slash 700 club interactive we're going to be having updates for you throughout the year as each one of these segments is produced uh, we're following IDF soldiers who uh, have gone on medical missions to do disaster relief in Nepal then when they get out of the service they take a year and they go provide humanitarian work and so we're embedded with one of those groups as they went to Mumbai we followed them in Haiti we followed them after the typhoon the devastating typhoon in the Philippines uh, we've got footage from Senegal we're getting documentary footage from the 1950s uh, how they worked in Africa for for decades and the world didn't know about it. But we want, we want to tell the story, and you can be part of telling that story of what Israel is doing to bless the world. Well, up next, a concentration camp survivor who's fulfilling her dream of living in Israel. See how she and others who endured the Holocaust are being helped by people just like you. Fira is a Holocaust survivor, and today she lives in Israel. She still suffers the emotional and physical scars from her time spent in a concentration camp. And even though she's a widow, Fira is not alone. All her needs are being met thanks to people like you. Fira loves to walk to the garden near her apartment in Hedera, Israel. But some days it's just too hard for her to make it. She suffers from the trauma she experienced during the Holocaust in Ukraine. I was nine years old when the Nazi came to our village. We were forced to march to a concentration camp with no housing, just open sky. I still remember the constant hunger and the cold ground where we slept night after night. Many of Fira's family members and friends died during the Holocaust, but she lived to see liberation. She later married a fellow survivor she met in the ghetto, and together they moved to Israel. Living in Israel was our dream, but now I am a widow and my body aches from those days in the concentration camp. I love to walk, but I can't go very far anymore. So CBN Israel bought Fira a walker with a chair that she can fold out when she gets tired. Every minute I have is important to me, and with this gift I can go wherever I want. It means so much. It means freedom. We also got Fira a washing machine for her apartment, and we take her food every week. CBN Israel even puts on parties for Holocaust survivors a few times each year, so they can socialize and feel a sense of community. Loneliness is not a good thing. So each time I get together with my friends, it's like a opening a window to the world. The support you give us is both physical and emotional. Having somebody remember us and care about us, we feel it. All I can say is thank you very much. Having somebody to remember us, somebody to care for us, that's what they're looking for. And you're reaching out with hands of love and compassion. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. It's real simple. All you have to do is just go to the phone and call us. Number's on the screen, 888-777-1999, and you can be a part of the 700 Club. How much is it? It's just $20 a month. It breaks out to 65 cents a day. And when you call and join, I want you to have this. It's our latest uh, DVD. It's called Heaven, What God Has Prepared for Those Who Love Him. If you're interested about what happens after we die, we've got testimonies, stories of people who were declared medically dead, uh, went to heaven, and have come back to tell us about it. Plus, we'll have an interview for you with a cardiac surgeon who worked in the ER 
and he had patients who were dead, who were dead on his table, and God brought them back to life. We'll give you those stories when you join, so call us. 888-777-1999 or you can log on to 700clubinteractive.com and if you want to designate your gift to help people in Israel we have a special fund called CBN Israel it supports our documentaries it supports those Holocaust survivors you just saw it supports our news news bureau in, in uh, Jerusalem it supports everything we do in Israel so if you want to designate your gift to CBN Israel. You can do it either by calling us or doing it on the website. Well, coming up, we'll take you to the Island of Tears, where scores of Syrian refugees are arriving on the shores of Greece every day. And the last people they expect are waiting to rescue them. Every day, boatloads of refugees are arriving on the shores of Greece, hoping to find a new start in Europe. And when they arrive, some of the first people they meet are doctors and rescue teams from Israel. The Greek island of Lesbos. A quiet vacation spot where tourists relax and local children play in peace. But on the other side of the island, a very different scene is unfolding. Every day, thousands of refugees arrive on this shore. Most are fleeing the Syrian civil war, hoping to resettle in Europe. We see babies which are only a few days old, old people at the age of 90, 95 even. And we get mainly people from Syria, also from Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran. Waiting to help them on the beaches of Greece are the last people the Syrians might expect, volunteers from Israel. My name is Tali Shaltiel. I'm here with Israel, an Israeli-based NGO. My name is Majida Kardosh. I'm here uh, as a medical team. I work as a nurse. My name is Iris Adler. I live in Tel Aviv. I just finished med school in Tel Aviv University. I came here uh, through Israel to be on the coast as a doctor. My name is Manal Shadi. I'm from Nazareth, and I'm the team lead of Israel in Greece. The Israel team is a mix of doctors and nurses both Arab and Jewish. I am a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Arabic is my mother tongue. I'm also a Christian, so I'm a minority inside of a minority inside of Israel. Being aware of my history, my background, where I come from, the history that my people went through, this is something that appeals to me. I mean, I can help refugees, so this is my job and this is what I should be doing. Our job here is to receive the boats of the refugees that are coming from the Turkish side to the Greek side. There are many, many volunteers on the beach, not many medical teams. On the line from the Turkish side, they're going through a lot of problems. There are smugglers there are asking them to pay between $1,000 to $5,000 per person. A lot of time they're just shoving them into boats that should fit 50 people, but there are 150 people on the boat. They just leave them midway through the sea and they tell them, you find your own way to Greece, we're not responsible on you. Or they put, they fill like half a tank of gas and they just leave them in the middle of the sea. What we do is go to Hind Point with binoculars, searching and scanning the water. And you start looking for this black with orange dots in the view. And then it comes nearer and you start seeing the rubber boat and all the people on it. It's like one, two, three, it begins. It's a few minutes of chaos. Taking off the babies, people screaming, shouting, helping them, you know, a lot of them don't know how to swim. They're afraid from the water. Here's the point that we start doing a triage, a very fast, you know, by hearing, they're talking, looking at the refugees. So we can see who is in need of medical help. And I start shouting, who need a doctor in Arabic? 
And so this is the time that we start giving treatment. I've treated a 14-year-old Afghani guy that was unconscious. He didn't receive aggressive treatment on the shore, on the spot. He might have not made it. After that, we start giving them food and water, warm clothes, something to eat, to drink, because some of them didn't have any water or food for like one or two days. After that, I take the map. We have a map that we translate on it in Arabic, explain to them what is the next step. You know, they don't know where they are, okay? I, so the first thing that I tell them that they are in Lesbos Island in Greece, because some of them, they had like no idea where they are. Most of them, they had nothing. They just come with their clothes only because they had to throw their bags in the sea or smugglers took their bags and threw in the sea. After a couple of days of assessing the field, we understood that the biggest need is a way to communicate with the refugees who come. So we brought a team from Israel, which is Arab speaking, and the effect was amazing. Hearing your language is very important to them, and then getting the instructions where to go, what to do next, what are the next steps, because they have a lot of uncertainty. And although Israel and Syria are technically at war, None of that matters here on the beach. Usually when they get to the beach, they're just happy to see people waiting for them, giving them help and food and clothes and medical treatment if they need. Sometimes they realize who we are and they, they're just happy to see us and they hug us and kiss us and it's very exciting. We get lovely, warm, like warming reactions of hugs and, you know, men kissing me like I'm their daughter, you know, on the forehead, saying thank you, saying that I would never have thought that I was going to receive treatment or be able to speak to, from an Israeli doctor or share my story with an Israeli who will empathize with what I've been through. This guy, he had, I think, a sprained ankle and he put some bandage and I wanted to take out of my bag some medicine to ease the pain, a painkiller. and. Uh, while I'm looking in my bag, this guy asks uh, Majda in Arabic, where am I from? Like, where is she from? Where is she from? And she was telling to him, what does it matter? You need help now. She's here to give it to you. Why are you focusing on that? And we continue with our work and whatever we were doing uh, at the time. And a few minutes afterwards, he comes to, uh, to me with a package of biscuits that he brought from Turkey for the journey. You know, giving me something from the nothing that he have and apologizing um, for not respecting me or questioning me. Um, and, you know, just giving me, you know, a thanks for being there. Israel is a political organization. What they do is help people in a disaster situation. And this is what I'm doing. And this is what they teach me at nursing school, to treat a human, no matter what he is, which religious he have, which color he is, what, what language he talks. To see a 60-year-old Arab man burst into tears on the shore, something that you don't see every day. So being able to give a hand, give a hug, give water, medical treatment, that's yeah, a privilege. Offshore, Israel doctors also provide trauma counseling for families in refugee camps. We start with the communication thing, talking Arabic, or put only hand on, on his or her shoulder, try to make them feel better, you know, as much as we can. In my country, in Syria, it's uh, coming very hard and there is no future for anyone. Yesterday, I have coming here with a plastic boat. I will say that they are amazing people. And uh, I'm really, really thanks everyone working with these people. They are really helping us and helping a lot of families here and children. Because we come from a country that a lot of people suffer trauma, 
because of the conflict and what's happening. So we have a lot of experience how to deal with trauma, how to deal with the conflict. And this is a knowledge that we need to pass to other people, to other countries, if we can help make their suffering less or to help support them or to show them a different way. And I think this is our duty. These people come and they automatically get this title. They are refugees fleeing to Europe. But then at the end of the day, they're just humans, they're families. They had honorable jobs, fulfilling life in the countries that they're coming from. And suddenly they come here and they're treated and looked as refugees when they're human beings as me and you. And for me, when I meet those people, this is what I'm trying to give them, that feeling that I respect them, I feel them, I connect to them in the most human level. I'm not above them or same, it's just now they're on that side of the coin. Tomorrow it might be me and I will need their help. I was thinking about that 60 years ago, it was the Jewish people in Europe during the Holocaust, after the Holocaust, making their journey to Israel or for different countries and seeking for a safe home. We're always saying, never again. When you see something difficult, for me, it's looking at my part. What's my responsibility? This is what we try to do, you know. We're coming as humans, meeting other human beings, and this is how change starts. Little. They are very lovely. They are give me hope to my future. They are really cool people. <laughs> I think that helping other people is a very important thing in the Jewish tradition. We can't just sit back and watch what's going on. We have to come and do the best we can. And even if we touched few people's life, I think that's a lot. I think we in America have a lot to learn from Israel. They're certainly living out their faith and living out the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. That's what the Bible says, and it says it in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have a lot to learn, both about how to maintain security in a very difficult environment, in an environment of terrorism, but also maintain our heart and our love and our love for our neighbor. I'll ask you a question. What can darkness do to light? And when you answer that question, it's pretty obvious. Darkness can't do anything to light. So we here in America, we need to let our light shine to let the nations know there is a God and we are one nation under God. We leave you with this scripture. You will arise and have compassion on Zion for it's time to show favor to her. The appointed time has come. And now we have some beautiful shots of the Holy Land, Israel, set to the tune of Hatikva, uh, which is translated the hope. It's the national anthem of Israel.